Today on Tal Flader Mouse, we're going to take a look at these very rare 1970s era Smith & Wesson police slugs. These rounds were an attempt to convert a 12 gauge pump action shotgun into an anti materiel rifle. At least that's how they were marketed. The Smith & Wesson police slugs were introduced in 1973. That same year, the actual inventors of this projectile, Ward Kelly and William McAlvin, received a patent for their design that they came up with nearly 10 years earlier. Unfortunately, it appears it was too late to prevent Smith & Wesson from ripping off their design, basically, and producing their own exact copy. Ward and McAlvin did go on to sell their product and had a company called Ballistic Research Industries, a small ammo company in California and they did have a law enforcement only version of their slugs. These used something called police alloy, which was just a harder, tougher version of their projectile. They sold their product already loaded in shells, but they also sold them as a loading component. Eventually, Ballistic Research Industries was bought out by Winchester, and the legacy of Ballistic Research Industries lives on in the BRI Sabo slug. Now let's take a closer look at the Smith & Wesson police slugs. I originally guesstimated this box came from the 1980s, but based on the coloring of the box, the artwork and all that, some folks over on the Buck and Slugs Reloader group on Facebook convinced me that this box may very well come from the mid-1970s. The 80s version had a completely different color scheme. Now if that's all true, this box of ammo is nearly 45 years old, but it's in remarkably good condition. We know that BPI received their patent in 1973, and it appears that Smith & Wesson filed for a patent themselves. When our box of ammo was produced, the patent was still pending. In other words, their patent hadn't been approved yet. Unfortunately, the box gives us no idea what velocities these were loaded at, but it does give us some expectations of what we might see, such as rifle accuracy, the ability to penetrate automobile engine blocks, bodies, and heavy barricades. And yes, you're probably thinking that can all be done just with a rifle, right? But at this time, rifles were pretty much relegated to SWAT teams and the regular cop would carry a 38 Special and a 12 gauge pump action riot gun in their car. Now it may seem completely logical to just simply introduce a different type of shell with a completely different purpose to those existing shotguns. But in a real world situation where seconds matter, that would require the officer to change out ammo, switching from one type of ammo to the other, and having the possibility of mixing it up. The shells we'll be testing today are in very good condition and have a distinctive blue color and a nickel plated base. Now let's pop the hood and see what 45 years of sitting on a shelf looks like. The first thing we see is the Sabo halves and the slug inside. One thing I thought was odd was the two halves of the Sabo are held together with clear tape. The tape itself seemed to be as fresh as it was when it was applied. It wasn't yellowed, it wasn't gooey or anything like that. And inside the Sabos we finally see the projectile. We don't see any oxidation, it looks like it was made last year in fact. So far these look like they were properly stored for all these decades. This slug weighs in at 28.9 grams or just over one ounce. The shape is a wasp waisted Diablo shape, only elongated. This means the slug will fly with stability without spin. Now these are supposed to be made out of an extra hard alloy and I was able to scratch away at it a little bit with a knife so it wasn't as hard as I expected it to be. The slugs are hollow base but are filled with some kind of a resin and the purpose of that is to prevent the wad from being shoved into the cavity. Under the slug and Sabo unit, we do have this hard fiber wad, and under that we have an Alcan Air Wedge gas seal. That's some old school stuff there. And then finally we have the powder charge containing 32 grains of an unknown powder. Now this is one component we really can't judge by its looks. Will 45 years make it more potent, less potent, or just perform the same as it was when it was fresh? All these components were loaded back into a new hole with a new primer. I was able to show you the internal components, but we'll also be able to see how primers hold up after 45 years too. Since we're dealing with a lot of unknowns here, safety is very important. The critical breach area of the shotgun will be covered with a Kevlar body armor panel to act as an explosive blanket. 
All right, well, first round we're gonna use our 30-pound uh, lead plate. That's kind of our standard for comparison. Um, aim point's gonna be here. About how thick is that thing? Inch and, well, we can get an exact here. Oh, look at that, he's very my, prepared. My EDC <laughs> tape measure. Let's see, inch and a half. Inch and a half thick of lead. But it weighs about 30 pounds, right? Yeah, right at 30 pounds. Okay. Whole it takes lead. a lot to penetrate that with a 12 gauge slug. And this is definitely the right test medium based on all our other tests and everything to, to okay. see what these things will do. I'm pretty. All right, here we go. Nice sharp recoil. Okay, it knocked the plate over. What happened to the plate? Oh, well, that, wow, that's interesting. Very, very close. Not bad for just a bead sight trying to peer over some Kevlar and all that too. I don't know how you were able to aim that thing with the Kevlar over the top. Oh. But look at look at the slug. It it, it is a hardened metal. You know, some kind of hard police alloy, but it it appeared kind of soft in there. So, did it bulge the back or anything? Or very very slight bulge. Nothing to write home about. So it looks like it went in about an inch and a quarter inch. Both Danny and I expected this slug to easily penetrate the lead plate. So what went wrong? Well, we recorded a velocity of only 1017 feet per second. We were expecting velocities at least 1300 or more feet per second. We got a lot of junk flying through the air. We got a gas seal, wad, and the sabos besides the slug. But as you can see, the slug is flying straight as an arrow. The accuracy was pretty decent. We just lacked that velocity to punch through that plate. It would appear, based on this first test, that 45-year-old powder may lose potency over time. It was starting to get a little windy out, so unfortunately I've got to talk over Danny here. From what I read in old magazine articles like on Field and Stream from when this slug was first introduced, it was supposed to be able to pierce one quarter inch of mild steel at 100 yards. And that's what we have here, one quarter inch thick mild seal rectangular tubing. Did not pass through. Boy, if that chronograph reading is right, these things are only going like a thousand feet per second. There's no data on the box telling us what it's supposed to be. Uh, point of aim was here. This one hit a little high left. Yeah, we know your aim is a lot better than that. Uh, I think it was this galvanized coating or the something. The galvanized yeah. coating is what. But yeah, this flew back here and remnants of the slug landed Look at that. right here on the table. That's right where they landed. Get that out of there. It's like a big washer. That's very interesting. In test number two, we have an even lower velocity. Now, even at this velocity, our extra hard alloy slug flattens out like a pancake. Now, one thing to think about is over distance, a slug like this loses a lot of velocity, especially at 100 yards. So it's entirely possible if the slug was factory fresh and at full velocity, it would have dropped down to this velocity at 100 yards and not be able to penetrate that quarter inch mild steel. All right, genuine military, not uh, chinese -ium. Got hit once here in the front, just kind of pushed it in a bit. We're gonna go for the side view here. And uh, what does this say? Advanced combat helmet specialty defense system. Military contract. 981. In this test, we see something that sometimes happens to rounds like this. It gets knocked out of orientation, maybe the bad Sabo release, and the slug ended up just flying sideways. Now, it's still traveling at the same velocity, so it has the same energy on impact. The force is just spread out over a much wider area. You're just going to have a lot less penetration. And of course the slug didn't even come close to penetrating this helmet. It caved it in pretty well though. Danny was able to find the remains of the projectile and can verify that it hit sideways.
I think people are going to want to see us redo that one. So instead of shooting the other cool target, maybe reshoot it again with a brand new helmet by Atomic Defense. Yeah, rotate that around so people can see it. Dougie, he, he's quite the trooper there. Yeah. So we're gonna shoot it at the back of the helmet, nice big area back there. It doesn't have a bunch of plastic stuff all around it. Try to hit that X, and I think it'll stop it. But hopefully this one will function correctly. Now this one, we could immediately see that the projectile was flying straight and true when it impacted this helmet. And just like the military issue helmet, this one caved in also. Whether or not you'd be able to survive an impact like that, well, we'll leave that up to your imagination. In this never seen before high speed footage, we could see how brutal that impact is. Just the inertia from the impact was enough to rip the Velcro patch off and send it flying. And it also whipped that little piece of black plastic out of its slot. Now even though we weren't able to achieve those factory fresh velocities, you can probably imagine how effective these things were when they were traveling at the right velocity. Everybody wants us to shoot an engine, but can't get anybody to drive their car out here. <laughs> no volunteers. <laughs> Next best thing, we got an old Kohler cast iron block. And uh, other than that, I don't know anything about it. I don't know what the horsepower is, and it's kind of irrelevant, but. Nice thick cast iron, just like a lot of engines. Some engines are aluminum, I realize that, but. Oh, look at that. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> but. Oh, no good. Definitely has a problem. Yep, it's going to have a bigger problem now. Well, maybe we can see what's going on inside when we get done here. Okay. <laughs> we have drained the oil out so we don't spill oil all over the place. And maybe that's a concern about shooting an engine is that car is going to keep driving potentially for miles, leaving a trail of, you know, hazmat behind it, you know, that they don't want to be yeah. accountable for, you know. No, I drain the oil out of this personally. So. Okay. Got a little residual in it, but that's it. Okay, let's. We, we got rags. Put a mark on there where, where you want to hit it. We're gonna try for right here. There you go. Make a bigger circle because you'll have a better chance of hitting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Might 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 make it, huh? Yeah. I remind you that this is the slug that I showed at the very beginning of the video, the one I scratched on and reloaded into a new shell. And this one performed about the same velocity as all the others. In fact, it was the second fastest slug in the test. It certainly appears that this particular powder degraded over the years and became less potent. That doesn't rule out the possibility that other types of powder may become more potent over time though. That was our last one. And will it go through an engine block? It'll, I guess, depending on what part of the engine block or engine component. That's about almost quarter inch there, maybe three sixteenths. Oh, okay. It's a little thicker than I thought it'd be. A little bit to the left. I touched this thing and something went clunk inside, so I'm assuming that was a slug, but it's locked up. Now. Oh, yeah. It, it, actually, it moved a little bit before, and now it hardly moves so yeah it would go about a half a rotation before okay <laughs> but wow definitely disable a a Kohler <laughs> <laughs> maybe a motorcycle engine or something somebody's attacking you with their lawnmower you'd be able to <laughs> stop them yeah. oh my gosh well we got consistent chronograph readings of around a thousand feet per second it was like 980 to a thousand something not the very i thought i was expecting higher velocity right. and at a higher velocity these things would have punched through everything that's what i was expecting yeah whether i don't know what the factory uh velocity is supposed to be their fresh you know velocity but that is much lower than i really expected and i think most people agree if if that thing was traveling at 1200 feet per second or it would have gone through the quarter inch plate. 
it would have gone through the lead plate. Anyway, it's still an interesting test. I mean, these things are pretty darn rare. There's not a lot of example of these out there and we wanted to share it with you guys instead of just taking the box, put it on a shelf and, you know, gather dust and we never learn anything from them. Yeah. It's more fun this way. Yeah. We, and whoever at Ballistic um, Products threw that in the box, I thank you, you know. I'm glad we were able to share that with everybody. No pass through, just for those who are going to ask. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. Squirted a little oil out of its gasket there. Huh. I would too if somebody shot me with that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that concludes the test. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Get well, Scott at Ballistic Mich or Kentucky Ballistic. There's too many ballistic things going on here. <laughs> yeah. We're praying for you, Scott. Yep. Get well.